I want to see when the smart money's taking profit, I don't want to buy. I want to wait. When the dumb money's taking a loss, now I want to buy. I want to step in and buy that pain. It helps you actually make your monthly DCA, which by the way, I've done for many years. Just literally pay check in, pay bills, empty bank account, all Bitcoin gone. You know, nowadays I'm a lot more strategic with it because I can basically see what all the market's doing. My paycheck comes in, I check my metrics. Oh, hang on, a bunch of guys are taking profit. I'll wait. If you were to buy every time it wasn't frothy versus every time it was frothy, you're probably saving 20%. So imagine Imagine if every single buy you've ever done, you're getting 15 to 20% more Bitcoin. I can't tell you the amount of times I've been on Twitter being like, yeah, guys, long-term holders are selling. Like no one sells. They're all hodlers. And I'm like, bro, I can see it. There's like massive amounts of realized profit. Instead of being a prediction, it's more a here's a zone of interest. If we get up there, we have to start looking for profit taking because at some point that will oversaturate demand and you start looking for a correction. So the retail in Bitcoin are serious dudes. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly why they're buying. Super high conviction. I want to be in the trenches with those guys. Gold stored my value. Bitcoin grew my value. It's actually better than a store of value because it's kicking ass. It's four times better than the next best thing. Bitcoin's in this really interesting world where it's both small and large. It's like a, a small fish that's just been put into a bigger pond. The ETFs are between 10 and 20% of the total market. There's been this like weird assumption that now that the Bitcoin ETFs are here, the entire market infrastructure that's been around for 15 years just gone, disappeared. No, it's still the 90% of the market. The ETFs are big, but they're not dominant. And today's topic is a topic that I did not spend too much time uh, in my in my learning Bitcoin journey uh, when I was uh, was uh, orange pilling myself. The today's topic is on-chain analysis. And I know like it's so great that we have this on-chain data, um, but I don't really understand like what can we learn from that uh, regards Bitcoin and then also other topics. Yeah, I mean, on-chain data is, is fascinating. And it's one of those things that for want of a better term, they don't teach you in school. Uh, and this, when I talk about this, like, you know, we all go through our own orange pilling journey, but what is so fascinating about it is it is Bitcoin. It is literally just the database that is Bitcoin, right? It's trans a transaction ledger of who owned what and when. And you'll be very, very hard pressed finding many of the talking heads. Like I've never heard Michael Saylor talk about on-chain analysis once. I've never heard most of these big talking heads talking about it, even though it is Bitcoin. But more importantly, if we take it like another level, what is, why is this like on-chain data important? It's us. It's all of the buying, the selling, the holding, the distributing, all those behaviors and those actions. We print those, those metrics. And, you know, ultimately it's about looking at how long people have held it, how much of the supply is held by these long-term holders. When do they start selling? Who are they selling to? How do those people who they bought it, how do they behave? And ultimately it's just behavioral economics. And Bitcoin, because of its very organic nature, it just moves coins from A to B. A lot of those coins are going in and out of exchanges. And it tells us about how much profit people are in when they're taking it, when they're like they bought high and they sold low, when they bought low and they sold high. And we can just extract these really interesting and quite frankly, very reliable patterns of human beings buying tops, selling bottoms, smart money, buying bottoms and selling tops, right? You can see all of these patterns and ultimately that's what it's all about. What can we learn from human psychology? Like we, we always hear that like, oh, like most people buy the top and then sell in the panic. And I see it also with, with some of my friends, unfortunately, sometimes uh, like the friend group outside the, outside of the Bitcoin group. What do you see, see there and, and uh, what is smart money doing? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's more or less the, the one big takeaway that I've learned from on-chain data. And to be honest, and from markets in general, the interest rates can change, Jay Powell's mood can change, right? The stock market levels can change. The one thing that will never change is human beings making decisions at the wrong time, at the exact wrong point because of their emotional state. It's why price charts in the 1920s look exactly the same as they do at any other point in time, because we have this like innate desire to feel like we're, I mean, we're part of a herd and we always want to feel good, right? When you buy an asset, you don't want to be the first man to do it. You want to be like, you know, kind of in the crowd. You want to let someone else jump off the cliff first and make sure it's safe. And we're like conditioned from a very early age to avoid risk. And markets are counterintuitively full of risk. Like they're all risk and you have to accept it. But human beings don't usually go through that process, right? It takes time to really become interested in markets. You mentioned you've got friends who aren't that interested in Bitcoin. I'm much the same. I would say probably a very similar cohort, probably a little bit bigger, but 
of your circle of friends, most of them probably aren't interested in markets either, right? They've got other shit that they're doing in their life. And that subset of people who are interested in markets, an even smaller subset of them understand Bitcoin, and an even smaller subset of that understands themselves in a market. And that's, I think, the most important thing. What does on-chain data tell you? It tells you what everyone else is doing. And when you can see what everyone else is doing, and you can kind of do the opposite, strangely enough, that's usually a very good tactic. So I look at myself back in 2018 when I got into this market. I bought high. It sold off. I was like, shit, what do I do? I know. I'll sell now and I'll buy back lower. And now that I go back and look at all my decisions back in 2018, I can see that I sold the bottom right before it ripped. And then I got excited and I bought the high right before it dipped. And you can see your old behavior patterns in the on-chain data. You're like, wow, I was the idiot. And you can like see it now. So what do I want to do? I want to do the opposite of idiot me and use those metrics to do the exact opposite and try and make better decisions along the way. Uh, I have a, <laughs> I have a, a work colleague, an old work colleague of mine that... Uh, perfectly timed to top like he re yep. literally like bought the day where the top was in the euro so i uh, and since then he's really disappointed with bitcoin but i i, I, I said to him like tell me when you buy again then i will say some <laughs> yeah um, so, like, strangely <laughs> enough i did the exact same so i bought the exact top in 2017 and it was actually so bad you could not have bought higher than me because at the top tick of the candle when i was doing my taxes back in 2018 or 19 whenever it was and uh, i looked at my taxes and Basically, my purchase price, because Coinbase had an extra fee for Australian dollars back then, you actually add the premium on top. And I'm like above the top tick of the candle. I'm like, I mean, you couldn't have done it better than me. And that was the first thing I ever bought. I'd never bought a stock. I'd never owned anything before in my life. Buying Bitcoin at the absolute top in 2017 was the, the first thing I ever purchased. And, you know, I learned that lesson. You pay your tuition in that bear market. I turned 10 grand into 10 cents. But that journey taught me so much about like, okay, something about this market thing is fascinating and I need to learn more about it. Then I found on-chain data and like it, it, markets are a process and like you're constantly learning. You never know the answer, but ultimately you're trading against yourself. You need to make decisions. You can't change the tide. Markets just are. All you can do is make your decisions based on the stimulus and information the market gives you. I love that a lot. I mean, I learned it a little bit before, like I learned it before Bitcoin because I was in Tesla and there was some lessons in there for me. Uh, oh, yes. But I, I really, I really like bought into like the, the selling off. Like I, I was, there was one year as 50% decrease in the Tesla stock. And I just saw that the business was growing actually. And I was like, hey, the, the, the stock getting cheaper and the business growing like, ah, oh, I need to buy more. That was a hard lesson for me, but it uh, was really getting, it really was good for me in, in Bitcoin. Um, the one question for me is like on on-chain data, can you label smart versus smart money versus dumb money? Where you're like, okay, that, that's kind of the, the smart money addresses and those like kind of the dumb money addresses. And then following that, if you can label that, can you even predict some trades there and can you make like a weighted DCA or something like that? I, I mean, I am not trade, like I'm just buying uh, anytime I have money, like anytime money comes in, I buy because I know otherwise emotionally I'm not prepared for anything like that. So I'm just saving myself the trouble and like when money comes in, I buy Bitcoin to, with yep. whatever amount I have. But if uh, that's possible, um, do, do you think that that would be actually possible labeling smart money and then using that information to make future trades? Yeah, so it's a great question. So when a lot of people think about on-chain data, they think uh, complexity like data sleuths in there, you know, I'm going to follow this guy's wallet and oh wait, this whale is doing something. I, I actually recommend do the exact opposite of that. And all that is bullshit. Whenever you see somebody who's like, oh, look, watch out for Mr. 100 or watch out for this whale. Ignore it. Okay. It's, it's complete noise. It's going to give you no alpha whatsoever. Um, when I think about on-chain data, I've, I, I've got like this framework idea. You'll find it on my website. It's like a, like a grid. So if you imagine the whole Bitcoin supply, it's just like a big block. And we're going to divide up that supply, all 21 million coins, divide it up into who owns it, how long they've held it. Is it in profit? Is it in loss? Is it being spent? Is it being held? So there's three axes and they're all perpendicular to each other, right? X, Y, Z. On the X axis, You've got the coins, are they moving or are they not moving? And on any, any one day, about 1% of the supply gets transacted. So you've got you know, 19.7 million coins and then a small fraction of those that are actually on the move each day. So in motion or stationary. The second axis, in profit, in loss. 
And you can probably already see just from those two axes, you've got the amount of supply that's held in profit, the amount of supply that's held in loss, the amount of supply that's moving or the volume in profit, volume in loss. And then the last axis gets onto your, your question about, you know, how do you track these people? That's what I call the cohort axis. And this is where stuff really gets quite magic. On that Z axis, the question is, okay, how do we group those coins that are in profit, that are volume in loss? How do we group that XY plane by individual, right? Not, not, not like tracking the individual guy. I want to see bundles of people who exhibit the same behavior. So one example of a cohort, show me all the shrimp. Show me all the shrimp who are in profit. That's an interesting metric. Show me all of the whales and exchanges who are in loss, right? You can do all sorts of things. But the cohort that really matters and what you'll see a lot of people talking about, and, it, and honestly, you don't need to learn any of the other ones, it's long-term holder, short-term holder. And ultimately, we use about a five-month window. When you've held your coins or a coin's been dormant for five months, it usually stays dormant, right? Now, that's in one exception. During bull markets, those old coins, six months, one year, two year, they all come back into circulation and get spent as the market rips higher. So most of the time, most coins do not move. When they get to long-term holder status, the best way to think about that, they're the smart money. That people who buy in a bear, they wait and they wait and they wait, and then they finally take profits when the market really rips higher. So if you're an investor, I want to do two things. I want to buy my Bitcoin when they're not selling, right? If long-term holders are selling, I don't want to buy because the smart money is exiting. Why would I want to buy at that point? And likewise, I want to wait when the dumb money sells at a loss. The people who buy high, you kind of want to step in and buy when they sell at a loss. So you can use this like, are the coins moving? Are they not? Are they in profit? Are they not? Who, right? By long or short term. Now I've got a really good framework to actually take an x-ray of the market. And I can see, I want to see when the smart money's taking profit, I don't want to buy. I want to wait. When the dumb money's taking a loss, now I want to buy. I want to step in and buy that pain. So it helps you actually make your monthly DCA, which by the way, I've done for many years, just literally paycheck in, pay bills, empty bank account, all Bitcoin, gone. And you know, nowadays, I'm a lot more strategic with it because I can basically see what all the market's doing. My paycheck comes in, I check my metrics. Oh, hang on, a bunch of guys are taking profit, I'll wait. And of course the market will always sell off at some point. There we go, that's my signal. Now I'll buy and I get more sats for my dollar. And that's really how I think about a lot of this stuff. So basically a, a weighted DCA where you like go into sometimes a little heavier in or sometimes you uh, don't go heavy in, but you don't use it as like selling Bitcoin. Correct. Correct. I basically, I, if I'm going to buy my Bitcoin and I get paid on the 15th, for example, of every month, I, I'm just going to make sure that on that particular 15th, I'm not going to get sold on because I, there's nothing worse. We've all done it hundreds of times. You buy and like the moment you've hit the green button, the price just sells off 10%. You're like, fuck, really? Really right now? I couldn't have waited like 10 minutes. But of course, if you look at the, the on-chain down and you go, well, there's a bunch of guys selling, the probability that that red candle is coming, I'll wait. Because when that red candle comes, at least now I was kind of semi-prepared for it. And then I buy at the bottom, not the top of that, that candle. It's not about picking like, you know, ultra in the weeds. I'm just saying if I've got a monthly DCA, I want to buy at the best time I can possibly find over the course of that month. How much better do you think uh, that strategy could perform if you really look at the on-chain data and you know what you're looking at uh, and you anyways just buy Bitcoin, you never sell, like you, you have most of your wealth in there, but you are careful with the timing of buying uh, yes. within a specific month. How much better of a performance do you think you can end up in like a five-year, 10-year uh, window? That's a great question. So I actually haven't done uh, any of those specific studies, but what I can say is that we started up the, the check on chain newsletter that we're doing at the moment. Um, we started that up in April. So the, the all-time high, the 73K has already been set and we've kind of had the first sell-off. Now, over the course of writing the newsletter for the last five months, there's been three events where I've released a, a newsletter. It's, it's been some iteration of this is what I think about the dip. And it's usually one of the advantages of being an Australian, by the way, is that when the Americans, when the market's selling off and all the Americans go to bed, I've got a whole day to create content and produce a newsletter. So when they wake up bright and early in the morning, it's there for them. Um, so there's been three instances where we've had these really big like waterfall nasty sell-offs that only Australians are awake for. 
And we, I, I think it to analyze and make a video and actually understand what's going on there. And the way I kind of frame it for my subs is I think the first one was at 56K. The second one was at 53. And then it was during that August 5th sell-off where, you know, granted it was only down in the 40s, 49 or whatever it was for, um, you know, two hours or three hours or something, but in that kind of $50,000 window. So 56, 53, and 50. The amount of messages that I've had from people going like, man, I, I wish that I had of like, looked at those metrics and gone, damn, I would love to buy at 56, 53, and 50, even if the market, just imagine, even if the market goes to 30, maybe like the, the, the world just wants the price to go to 30K for whatever reason. I would rather have bought my coin at 56, 53, and 50, and then it goes to 30, than all the other guys who are like, man, I got coins at 60 and 73 and 70. Like I thought I was really excited. So if you just look at the delta between the level where people were taking profit versus when people were capitulating, sure, you may still see some of your coins go underwater. That's kind of expected in markets. But I'm not down 30%. I'm down five or 10, right? So suddenly you're like, I can actually, in Bitcoin, who cares about a 10% down? We deal with this shit all the time. But when you're down 30%, that's when like your emotional state's like, oh, that feels really bad. And that's what makes it hard to hodl. When you buy at the wrong time and you've got to carry this really heavy bag, that's what actually like wears down your stress levels and all these things. So ultimately, if you're just trying to lower that cost basis, you're going to do much better. It's going to be so much easier to actually navigate these markets. Mm, that's interesting. Do you have, um, for someone that is not an expert like me, for someone who just holds and wants to still get a little bit in, in on-chain data, do you have resources where you're like, okay, there I can look. I heard something, class notes, like those kind of websites uh, I looked on there sometimes um, where we can actually look at those metrics and maybe even um, how we make an informed decision of like, okay, now it's a, a little bit of a worse time to, to buy. Maybe I, sh I should wait like half a month, a month to, to buy in and maybe then it's better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got two, right? The, the newsletter we do is literally two pieces of content a week to help people do this. And one of those, which interestingly enough, we just did a survey of all of our subscribers. And um, I always knew that the masterclass, like actually telling people this is how to interpret these metrics and how to like really, really giving people a proper course on how to understand this stuff. I knew there was demand for it. I didn't realize there was this much demand for it. People love it. And that's fantastic because like a lot of people really want to learn these tools. And Honestly, for the vast majority of hodlers, you only have to learn two metrics. Once you go down that rabbit hole, you'll find there's a whole bunch of other things. Just like Bitcoin, you'll be like, oh, cool. I want to pick this up and play with this. Um, but really, if you can learn MVRV and the variance of it, short-term holder MVRV primarily, and there's another one called SOPR, S-O-P-R. It's literally the system metric. MVRV shows you how in profit the market is. So if it's at two, it means the market's up 2x on average. If it's at 0 0.8, the market's down 20%. Um, so MVRV is the held coins. What's their profit and loss? SOPA is the spent coins. Are people locking in a 5%, a 10%, a 20%, 30% profit? What's the average profit being locked in or loss? Those two metrics is all you need. If you learn short-term MVRV and short-term SOPA, you don't need anything else. They are the hodler's best friend. Um, they tell you just about everything. You can tell when it's a bear market. You can tell when it's a bull You can tell when it's a capitulation. You can tell when it's a, a, a euphoria wick that you shouldn't be getting anywhere near. You you can tell all of this purely from those two metrics. So we try to do a masterclass, but then um, you can head over to uh, charts.checkonchain.com and we've got a whole suite. Every every metric that you could ever want is uh, is completely free over there. We've got all these tools. Um, so that's really the, uh, for me, on-chain data is Bitcoin. Bitcoin's open source. I love making this stuff open source and that's ultimately what this is all about for me. So making the data nice and free and uh, available for everyone. It's really cool. Like those two metrics, if I understand it correctly, the one is like unrealized gains, what the yep. market has and realized gains, what the market Correct. has. Correct. That's exactly what exactly. they are. Yep. Okay. That's, that's a really interesting uh, thing to look at. Like, because of, of course, if the unrealized gains are minus, this means like we're in a bear market and it's probably a, a good uh, time to buy. And if we are uh, in a, in a bull market where the unrealized gains are high, then it's probably like a, a time where you can maybe uh, make a little bit of, of a, a fiat cushion and maybe buy later a little bit. That's an interesting that, insight. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that, and that is, that is literally as easy as it gets. So every time you go for your DCA, 
check short-term MVRV. If it's really high and short-term SOPA is really high, just wait. If it comes back down and you'll see that both of these metrics tend to like bounce along one, one is the break-even level. And they'll bounce along there and like buying as close to one as you can in a bull is thumbs up. If you get those levels below one, you know, that's when you're getting like, you know, it could be a bear, but also the bottom of a dip looks exactly the same as the start of a bear. So you kind of can, you know, frame it up. Like you just want both of those metrics as low as possible because it's showing you the market is not frothy. And ultimately for a hodler, if you're here for the long term, if you were to buy every time it wasn't frothy versus every time it was frothy, you're probably saving 20% because what's a Bitcoin correction? 20 odd percent thereabouts. So imagine if every single buy you've ever done, you're getting 15 to 20% more Bitcoin every single time, right? That's the compound of return of just looking at two metrics just before you do your DCA. That's amazing. Yeah, really cool insight. Um, can you make also, or do you also make uh, long-term price predictions based on that when you see the past like five, 10 years of, of Bitcoin history on on-chain and with the Bitcoin price and then extrapolate that out like five, 10, 20 years? Yeah, so I, I uh, you actually will probably never get a price prediction out of me because I don't think they're useful because at the end of the day, who knows? The market's going to do whatever it does. Um, one of my favorite kind of personal journeys or lessons, I guess you call it, is I came across, there was one time and I just realized I don't know. And no one knows, right? The market over the next 10 minutes, it's literally a coin flip, flip a coin, who knows where it's going to go. Um, over the and, and actually, I did a study, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, and I literally looked at the distribution of price returns, right? On a one day, what's the, are we up five? Are we down three? What's the percent distributions? I think it was 48% of the time we're down and 52%, no, it was 52% of the time we're down, 48% of the time we're up. So on any particular day, there's literally a coin flip whether we're going to be higher or lower. Like it's quite literally just how it trades. Um, now, obviously, there's more down days in a bear and more up days in a bull. Um, I don't do price predictions because I don't think they're useful. A lot of people love them, right? Power laws and stock to flows. I, I just think that that's misleading because there's no reason for those to work. There's no gravity there. It's just like purely a meme and people who kind of don't know better get hooked on this stuff. What I do do, however, is we know that people like, people do sell. That's just reality of it, right? Um, we can see it. And I can't tell you the amount of times I've been on Twitter being like, yeah, guys, like long-term holders are selling. Like no one sells. They were all hodlers. And I'm like, bro, I can see it. There's like massive amounts of realized profit. And of course, this is going to be at the top, right? There's going to be a whole bunch of selling going on at the top and everyone just can't believe it. So people do sell. So um, what we look for, show me when MVRV, right? Unrealized profit. Show me when the paper gains are going to be 300%. Because historically speaking, when it gets to 300%, people start to sell, right? I can look at the on-chain data of the past. I can look at the on-chain data today and say, well, are we seeing a price level? What price do we have to get to for MVRV to go to three? Because once it gets there, my expectation is based on every single previous time it's done that, guys start to sell. So rather than a price prediction, I can look at what price will investor behavior change. That's the way I like to think about it. So instead of being a, pr a prediction, it's more a here's a zone of interest. If we get up there, we have to start looking for profit taking because at some point, that will oversaturate demand and you start looking for a correction, right? So you start making making adjustments to your portfolio accordingly. Interesting. Um, how do you actually track the, the data of someone selling? Because it's like um, on-chain, I mean, obviously we know the ones of exchanges, so those are kind of um, more seeable, I guess, when someone yep. moves from cold storage to the exchange. But if someone, for example, actually spends the Bitcoin and for example, they have one Bitcoin and all of a sudden, uh, 10 million Satoshis of that are moving to another address that could be because he wants to start diversifying his one Bitcoin on different cold storage solutions. Or it could be because he sent some Satoshis to someone else because he, he bought a, a service or something like that. Do you have a way to differentiate that? Uh, or because maybe the Bitcoin is still in his uh, control and he's, he's hodling, <laughs> but in, in yep. a different solution? No, that's, that's a fantastic question. And the truth to this is, no, I don't filter for it. And uh, I've gone through, I mean, I, I, I've spent a lot of time with this data. I've spent a lot of time with very proprietary tools that do filter for it. And as with everything in life, there's trade-offs. So the process of filtering out things like exchanges and self-spends and all of that, 
Um, what it does require is the data is always changing because a, a wallet that doesn't look like Binance today could be Binance tomorrow. And you're like, oh, I, actually, I've got to. Not only that, you need a whole team of people working 24 hours to try and track all these while they're constantly changing every single day. These heuristics and patterns and all this stuff changes. Now, I ran as a result of this, I ran a bunch of studies where I'm like, okay, let's look at the filtered data, which is very expensive to create. Let's look at the non filtered data. And for my style of analysis, well, I don't care about intraday stuff. I'm not doing algorithmic trading. I'm really just looking at like, using my experience, understanding how this market works to make, you know, on, on a daily time frame. you don't need higher resolution than that. So I'm looking at this data within my context and how I analyze markets. And I found that there's about 85 to 90% of the signal in the unfiltered data. And I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And like, ultimately, if you're doing a wallet consolidation for the vast majority of people listening to this, and if this doesn't apply to you, congratulations, the amount of Bitcoin you have and moving around is just not big enough to matter, right? Congratulations if that doesn't apply to you. Um, but the vast majority of us, we, you know, we're, we're just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of nothing. And at the end of the day, the error bars around me moving from one cold to another, yeah, it's an error bar, but it just gets absorbed in the total noise. And what we find is that we don't have like one day where every single person does UTXO management. One guy does it on Tuesday. One guy does it next Thursday. Like we're all kind of, so it's like this like base load of error that's just always there. What we do see is that when the market is ripping to the upside, every man and his dog is cracking out the cold card and saying, I've got to take 10% off the top. I have to sell some. And likewise, when we get down to bear market floors, one of my favorite things, whenever I make content that's like near the capitulation bottom, when it's like finally at the end, I'll look at realized loss and you'll see this massive spike where people bought high and they sold low. And a lot of these guys in a bear market, they buy the absolute top and they hodl and they hodl and they grit their teeth. And then we get to the absolute bottom. FTX blows up and they sell everything. And that's, of course, the perfect capitulation signal. And without fail, my comments will be full of guys being like, nah, bro, it's just tax loss harvesting. And I just like, I'm like, you don't tax lost harvest in a bull, do you? It's like the same behavior thing that we all do at the bottom of a bear. So even if it is tax lost harvesting, it's a very consistent behavior. And we don't worry about the baseline. We worry about the deviations from the baseline. Show me when realized profit is screaming higher or realized loss is screaming higher. That's information. So um, that's how I would kind of address that is that the filtering, you can do it. For the vast majority of people, you're probably not going to get much signal from it. And I've spent so much time with this data that you can deal with these error bars just by knowing what you're looking at, right? So when Mt. Gox does something and I see a big spike, everyone's like, holy shit, look at all these coin days destroyed. I'm like, eh, it's Mt. Gox. Just ignore it. So you can like overlay your experience to deal with a lot of these, these error bars as well. Um, maybe I'm like, I'm not native to English, so uh, maybe that's just a stupid question. But what is tax loss harvesting? Ah, good question. So the idea is, and it depends where you live in the world, but let's say you bought an asset at $100 and it's trading at 50. You can sell it at 50 and then buy it back at 50, right? And the idea is that you've locked in a $50 loss, which you can remove from your, like, it depends where you live, but um, quite often tax jurisdictions, they'll allow you to write that off as a loss. So it kind of cuts out your, let's say you made $200 on another stock, that $50 gets taken off your profit. So you've kind of made 150 rather than 200. So a lot of people do this. A lot of institutions will do this. They take their losses and they lock them in, but sometimes they rebuy the asset, but they've kind of locked in that loss which reduces their taxable income. So it's called harvesting a tax loss. Yeah, that's an interesting tactic. I, I never thought about that. Andrew. I mean, it, it doesn't apply for me because I'm in the, in, the, in the lucky situation where I bought Bitcoin before 2021. And in, Bit, in Austria, the law, I mean, probably doesn't apply to everyone, but in Austria, the law is like, if you buy Bitcoin for before 2021 in February or something like that, you don't have to pay uh, capital gains like zero. Oh, nice. uh, Congrats. After, That's great. After, after that, you have to pay. And then also, it's also the law uh, from your stack. The first one you bought is also the first one you are selling again. Ah, so, uh, so it's forced so to be first in, last, first in, first out. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's that's great. So, like, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, if I ever sell 
as a sold, I did not sell it until now. If I was, I actually have, I don't have a, a, a capital gains, but that's an interesting thing. Tax loss harvesting. I never heard of. Yeah, it's, it's very of, common. Um, it's very common. Certainly, I know in Australia you can do it. Um, US definitely. So. Yeah, it's where, again, it, it's one of those niche things that all the reply guys like, nah, bro, it's tax loss harvesting. I'm like, you know, some people in the world don't even know what that is. Come on. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable and extremely heavy if i put it on the desk i seriously fear for my own table it's so so heavy and durable i love it this is where my seed phrase is secure go to bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you use code robin you even get five percent off of your complete order and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you you have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much yeah, it's, it's it's also possible in austria uh, i know about it because i did a lot of stocks before uh, but I never knew the, the technique because, yeah, of course, if you uh, uh, get in a loss and then just buy it again, uh, that's an interesting strategy. Yeah, really yeah cool. I Thank mean, you. some um, countries have different rules where it has to be like a month between them. Yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff there, but that's just nuance. Absolutely, yeah. Perfect. Then, but you brought up one interesting question because I think most people overestimate what the average Bitcoin holds on Bitcoin. <laughs> Yes, I think, I think oh, big the, time. The, the average Bitcoin holds like very little amount of, of Bitcoin. Um, maybe those who are really engaged in the Bitcoin community and like uh, like speaking about it and doing a lot of stuff in Bitcoin, maybe that average is higher. But the overall average of people holding Bitcoin, that's not high. Do you have a number of like that's the average Bitcoiner? having as, as how many satoshis is that and also do you have make a difference between uh, engaged people and long-term people and people that uh, are short-term in the market and, and long-term in the market uh, different uh, statistics for that yeah so i don't i don't have very um spe uh, specific stats on it what i can say is that uh, when you look at retail um, now retail historically has been you know in any kind of asset if you're an institution you're there to take money off retail because they generally represent the dumb money and they often consider them one and the same. Bitcoin's a little bit different. Um, in old coins, absolutely. The retail is absolutely the dumb money. When you look at Bitcoin, it has a very unique property 
where I know I, I just like lump everyone together. Everyone's got under 10 BTC. And the reason for this, when you take everyone who's got under 10 Bitcoin, that is still retail because, you know, if you go back five years, 10 Bitcoin was acquirable for many people, right? You know, if it's trading at $2,000, 3000 people could actually legitimately buy that without too much of a hassle, a bit harder today. So there's kind of that side of the equation. But there's also, um, if you've been a hodler for a long time, you may have 10 Bitcoin because you've accumulated 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and you've just done this for years and years and years and just kept chipping away at it, right? Over time, you, you accumulate less. But it, it's one of these things that that's probably about the boundary where retail sits. And what we see consistently, now it's not perfect, but we see, I look at like a 30-day change of this like retail size wallets. And if you look at a 30-day change, they tend to sell tops and they tend to buy heavily at bottoms. And one of my favorite insights, I've got a version of this chart on my website. There was the, the biggest by far, like not even close in history was the 2017 top. And that was me, right? That was literally me being an idiot buying the absolute top. It was just a huge wave of buying. And then it cratered. These people got wiped out. And I know because I lived through it. You get this bear market, and then we never got even remotely close to that top for years. When we re we actually blew that level out, when three arrows blew up, and then when FTX blew up. So just think about the psychology of that. I understand why people bought in 2017 because that was me. I was very excited, and Bitcoin's going to change the world. I'm going to be rich, right? That was the wrong decision. But then they waited for five years. And then they bought at the same scale in a raging bear market, the most horrific bear market we've seen in a very long time. Exchanges are blowing up. Companies are going bankrupt. Wild stuff. And that's when they bought. And you think about it, it's like, well, what was my journey? I listened to countless hours of podcasts. I read countless books over that period. My conviction from 2017 to 2022, I also bought like crazy. And I was like, my God, these guys are geniuses. They are the hardest people in this market. So the retail in Bitcoin are serious dudes. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly why they're buying. Super high conviction. I want to be in the trenches with those guys. So Bitcoin is a very interesting asset where retail isn't the dumb money. There's going to be dumb retail, but don't fade retail in, in Bitcoin because they are actually the people who've done the most work. People in that shrimp cohort have done more study on Bitcoin than Michael Saylor has. And that, I think, is a really, really interesting and probably un underappreciated factor of Bitcoin is how successful the education machine has been. And it's all open source, right? You've got a podcast. I've got a newsletter. I've got a podcast. People just make information free. And this is what makes this asset so fascinating. And like people are just intellectually stimulated by it. And it's, it's, it's truly, it's tremendous. So there's no like specific number that you're like, okay, like 0 0.1 Bitcoin or something like that. Uh, there's, there's no No, average. I realize I didn't even answer your question at all. No, <laughs> I, I've, I've never actually run the statistics. I mean, in order to do that, you, I mean, you could do it, but um, the, you would require, I mean, what I don't do is like get right in and pull out every UTXO and a, it's just big data type stuff. I don't get involved in that because it would be an interesting stat, but there's so much noise in it too. It's like, is that an exchange wallet? Is it not? It, it's just a very, very complex task. And um, yeah, I guess the, the question is, does it um, does it give us a great deal of information? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, I think there's a psychology thing going on. Like, if if people want to buy, uh, if if Bitcoin is the future and people want to now buy in Bitcoin, they they might be maybe thinking like, oh, like I want to have at least so many Bitcoin that I'm considered rich in when yes. Bitcoin is successful in 50 years. Like there's something uh, yes. along those lines. And I also noticed like, because I had some, some videos with the title, like, Oh, get to blah, 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 Bitcoin. And those are doing amazingly good. I was, con I, yeah. I was, people want to be whole coiners. Exactly. A, a whole coiners are like, just like they were like, X amount of Bitcoin. Okay, that's where I should shoot for, like that psychology, like of holding on getting to a target. Um, so, uh, and uh, just on a, on a very interesting kind of psychological element, there. Uh, have you heard of these guys who do this UTXO? I think it's called UTXO dot live. Basically, what they've done is they recognize that psychology. Human beings love to send one hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, like exact round numbers of Bitcoin. So you can actually see if you plot on any particular day. You can see these clusters of like everyone spent this much Bitcoin. Everyone spent this much Bitcoin. And it usually aligns with 100, 1,000, 10,000. You can see these like gradations. So from that, you can actually 
back calculate the Bitcoin price. So you can use the UTXO set. To, I think they're within like plus or minus two to 5%. They can actually extract the Bitcoin price from just the UTXOs purely by the way that people spend their money, which is a fascinating insight. But like, you know, it's, it's we're, we're, we're creatures that love to follow these patterns. That's an amazing insight. Right. So like, uh, because people are like sending, yeah, it's, it's true. Like I also send usually the same amount actually uh, there. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 funny. And it's also why it's hard to estimate your original question of like how much Bitcoin do people have, because you may have you may have ten Bitcoin, but what do I see as a as a UTXO analyst? I see months and months and months of zero point ones. It could belong to anyone. I don't know who owns those things, right? So it's that like those UTXOs until you spend them all in one transaction or you do something that really proves they're all you. And even then, imagine how many people you've got to track to work that out. You see all the DCAs but you don't see the total amount that individual holds. So that's kind of a cool element to it too. Yeah, that's also interesting. And also, um, I think uh, the the differentiation between retail versus institutional money is also interesting because uh, Michael Saylor himself, let's say he has like, I don't know, 15 or 20,000 Bitcoin, something along those lines. I don't remember the exact number. Then Michael Strader has 210,000. I think he's got to over 1%. So he's got over 210,000 now. Yeah, two hundred ten thousand with MicroStrategy, but him personally has like ten or twenty thousand. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think he uh, he uh, said in one interview that he has like seventeen thousand, and that he has substantially more than that, like more than that now, but something like that. And the difference that I wanted to make is like uh, you want to count the Michael Saylor with his seventeen thousand into retail, kind of, even though it's like the size of the retail that it gets. But micro strategy, you don't want to get into retail. So, like this differentiation is probably also really, really hard to to make on chain to to Correct. find out like who who's the the richest bitcoiners. And I don't want to have uh, like uh, micro strategy in there and other big companies in there, especially now where it gets more and more popular for companies to buy bitcoin and put it on the balance sheet because of that it's, companies have more purchasing power than a single person. Exactly. That would be and, and what I would say is just for your listeners. Um, you will you will see on Twitter and all these social programs, lots and lots of people love to talk about whales. So my advice after spending a lot of time with this data, there is almost zero edge and alpha in studying whales, almost none. It's all, every single time you see someone be like, oh, it's Mr. 100. It's not, it's an exchange. So for every, oh, Mr. Whale is buying, it's actually people depositing, people selling. It's not people buying. So your your interpretation is exactly wrong. And a lot of people will then defend that and say, but oh, but who's the client? I guess it doesn't matter. The fact that you don't know what this wallet actually is means that you can't make any interpretation on it because you could be perfectly backwards. So strangely enough, Whale data is very memeable. Lots of people like it. It's complete dog shit. There's no value in it whatsoever. On the other side of the equation, all the macro stuff, right? Long-term holder supply, short-term supply, MVRV, huge amounts of alpha. No one cares about it. So, you know, in terms of like trying to make the most out of your time, go to where no one else is studying. How do you see social media and uh, news articles and and all the, the the sometimes like this panic or this this formal in social media rising influencing the on chain data? There's probably like some that I, I'm remembering this like this fear and creed index that I always see on on Twitter. How do you see yep. social media influencing actually on chain data? So one of my favorite lines is uh, I love watching the narratives on Twitter not happening in on chain data. Because it is so obvious. You will see it all the time. And this is what I try to like get my subs prepared for. You mentioned predictions before. Um, one of my other lines is that I don't predict, but I try to prepare. So I don't know what the future holds. It could be anything. What I want to do is have people who are my followers prepared for what could happen. So we don't know the future. But if if we were to trade down to 47,000, there's a key on-chain um, price model down there. It's going to be scary as hell. The narratives on Twitter are going to be, it's over, and the bears will be out in force. If we do get into the 40,000s, you can imagine it, right? People will be terrified. Check on chain subscribers will know that that is probably, that is probably where the bulls are going to mount their biggest defense. Now, will they win? I don't know, maybe. But I can expect they're going to put up a hell of a fight. And will I be there in the trenches with them? Absolutely. That's a level where I'm like, I'm very comfortable to buy Bitcoin here because even if it goes to 30K, 
I'm quite happy buying at 47, right? I was happy buying at 50 and 53. These are all prices that I think are very valuable. So in that instance, the narratives are almost always, particularly the extremes, absolute noise. So uh, I think that the on-chain data, it, when you see the narratives on Twitter and then you go and look at SOPA, every man and his dog will be saying 100K and the on-chain data will be saying long-term holders are selling like crazy. So maybe 100K, but probably not just yet. And this is like, I use it to just ground myself and remove all that noise from Twitter. Um, more often than not, the noise you get on Twitter is noise. It's not signal. So interesting. Uh, in that debate, lo a lot of people, I uh, get it sometimes in the comment, like, oh, like uh, Bitcoin prices anyway is controlled by the, the whales and the whales are trying to manipulate the markets. Uh, it's it's. I think it's ridiculous, <laughs> uh, but is there any uh, on-chain data, is there anything to that argument? Um, I have asked, uh, whenever I see that, and I get it often, uh, my question is based on what? And I just wait until they give me some piece of evidence, because I, I would love to see it. There is no question that in markets just generally, there are big entities who have more purchasing power and more control. In fact, we actually should expect people to manipulate markets. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say you're a big institution and you want to buy a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. You need a billion dollars worth of people to be wrong and sell it to you. So how do you do that? I don't know. Maybe you start selling first to generate some fear, right? Get all those people to sell a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin to you. So, and this is not like, this is not manipulation. This is how markets work. This is just the nature of them. They're always like this. So it's one of those things where a lot of people spend a lot of time complaining about manipulation without kind of just accepting that it's like, what are you going to do about it? And it's, it, it's always going to be this way. It's never going to change. Some guy's going to have more money than you. He's going to want to achieve an outcome. And this is why like getting chopped up in the small time noise is where so many people go wrong. They, they zoom in on the one hour chart and they panic and they're like, holy shit, it's all falling apart. And then I zoom out and I look at the monthly chart. I'm like, it looks like a bull flag, guys. I don't know about you. Like it looks really, really healthy. Um, these big dogs work on the monthly and the weekly timeframes. They don't care about the hourly. They may go down to the hourly to do some hand-to-hand -hand combat and like take people's money. But at the end of the day, they care about the big trend. And people so often, I know it's a cliche, but these guys actually do zoom out. They don't zoom in. They only look at the big picture trend and then they get their, their analysts to go and sort things out in the smaller time frame. So, you know, um, whale manipulation, it's always there. What are you going to do about it? People complain. They do a lot more complaining than actually delivering any kind of evidence to be like, here it is. Here's the, the footprints and the fingerprints of it going on. Yeah, it's also the, the thing why I think it's ridiculous because manipulating means buying and selling and buying and selling yeah. is the free market. Yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. And it, it's so interesting for me. It, I kind of have that feeling when they write in the comments and I feel like they, they think there's like a secret telegram group where all the whales are coming together and like, hey, today we are selling and let's push the market down so we can buy tomorrow. Like, like I don't know if this exists, but I'm fairly certain that it probably doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so, so I would say there are those Telegram groups, but the, I guess the question is for the, for the reply guys in the audience who, who you know, think that there's manipulation, do you think there's manipulation because you bought and then the price went down? Or it, like if you just buy when SOPA and MVRV are low, there will be less manipulation is probably the way I would frame it because your buyers will all be better. And then you won't worry about the manipulation because you're buying when the whales have manipulated the price down, just buy then, right? Just change your system. That's a, that's a, that's a great way to think about it. Um, to, the, to the point, do you think the, the volatility of, of Bitcoin is a, is a good thing? Uh, absolutely. So if you look at the volatility chart for like realized volatility, it goes up in a bull. So it goes down in a bear. So whenever people like Bitcoin is too volatile, it's like, that's great. I love it because when Bitcoin is volatile, it means it's going up. Um, it trades a lot more like a commodity. Um, this is commodity-like behavior. Volatility goes up in a bull. Um, in, in stocks, it's the opposite. Equities tend to have lower volatility. It's like this slow, manipulated. Talk about manipulated. Look at the stock market. It's like a straight line. It just goes up. That's manipulated, guys. That's ridiculous. Because the world around us, look around. There's nothing low volatility about it. It's crazy. So this like straight line up, that's the bullshit. So um, the volatility of Bitcoin, it's scary for people. However, it's, it's the asset. And I think Michael Saylor does do a good job of talking about this. It's like at the end of the day, 
you do not go from zero to global reserve asset without a bit of volatility. You need volatility. For the most part, it is to the upside. So, you know, it's all about trade-offs. And, you know, for some people, volatility can't deal with it. But, you know, you've probably been around this market long enough. You get used to it. And uh, I think long term, I I look at my own self, right? I've seen my net worth drop by 75, 80% multiple times. There ain't nothing like that to harden you up. Imagine when all these people end up who've, who've like weathered some of this shit and they've gone into decision making or politics or company CEOs or whatever. They're going to be able to make really hard decisions because they've been through some really hard stuff. And I think that that's actually, it's it's, it's massively underappreciated. I find when people are like, oh, I don't want it to go down 20%. I'm like, then don't invest because like, what are you, what are you here for? You're going to get your 5% returns and have nothing at the end anyway. You have to accept that risk is a part of it. A lot of people also equate volatility to risk, but like if it's volatile to the upside, that's great. And even when you look at it from the volatility standpoint, sharp ratio, Saltino ratio, however you want to measure it, you are more than compensated for the returns. So even though it goes down, it goes up so much more. And it not only does it go up so much more, it blows every other asset in the world out of the park multiple times, year after year after year. So it's kind of like an undeniable fact. And when you see people who, particularly TradFi guys, like, oh, it's too volatile. I, I, I think it was um, was Harper from, from Swan. He did this great exercise. He could not convince his TradFi mate to buy Bitcoin. He was working for an investment firm. And he made Bitcoin like a, like a hedge fund tear sheet, just like, you know, hedge fund X. And he showed their return profile and their sharp ratio. And he gave it to the same guy. He goes, mate, what do you think about this guy's returns? And he goes, oh, mate, we have to invest in this. It's like, it's Bitcoin, dude. Like it's, it's it's not a hedge fund. It's just Bitcoin, because like if you just take away the wrapper, it it makes a whole lot of sense. That's a that's an amazing insight. Um, there's also that the, there's this narrative around Bitcoin being an inflation hedge and and uh, being a hedge against debasement, and I think a lot of outside people from that the, they are not in Bitcoin, the trade fire guys, they think of like, oh, Bitcoin is that or wants to be that. Um, and then they see the volatility and then they're like, oh, like inflation went up this month, 10%, but Bitcoin went down 5%. Like, oh, obviously yeah. it's not an inflation. Let's, let's look at the net latest hourly candle and make a holistic assessment of the whole asset. Yeah. yeah and that, that's so funny for me because like, yeah, yeah, like it. It's a growing asset. Like it, it gets like it ha- it's not on this final edge. Like it, B- Bitcoin is still in an adopting curve, and I think that's yep. like what well, well, people think of like. But is there? Do, do you see that um, as the main uh, narrative around Bitcoin for being an inflation and debasement hedge? Or what's your like? Why why Bitcoin? Like what's the the main story or narrative uh, for you? Yep. No, I think I think primarily Bitcoin is the store of value asset. I think that's its primary narrative and and role. And uh, the story that I'll kind of give here to, to illustrate it, it, inflation is a relative thing. So there's obviously the debasement, which is that we our, our fiat currency loses purchasing power. Now, I don't particularly worry about the price of bread in Bitcoin because I use my fiat currency for that. Yeah, it's painful that it's going up, but how do I solve that problem? You just got to have to go and earn more money. That's just, That's just the nature of the beast. So in terms of my living expenses, my medium of exchange life, that's an Australian dollar problem and that's that's its own basket. When we move to, okay, I don't particularly care about the next month, two months, three months, five months. What is my inflation rate, right? My inflation rate is houses because I don't own a home and at some point I'd like to buy one. So for me here in Australia, my inflation rate is something in the order of between 12 and 20% a year pretty hefty, right? Our property market's going through the roof. Whether it can keep doing that, who knows? But my inflation rate is 20% a year. So let's look at how is my Bitcoin, my savings, how is my savings doing at storing value to buy the thing that I want, which is the house? Since 2020, 1st of January, Australian house prices, and this actually is data only up to March um, this year, because it's quarterly. The Australian house price is up uh, 45% versus the Australian dollar. So over the course of that four years, it's up 45%, I think. It's down 75% in BTC terms. So what does that mean? Even though the Australian dollar has lost 40%, 45% of its purchasing power versus the thing I want to buy, my savings can buy me four times more house. That is a store of value. 
over that meaningful time frame, over the thing that I want to buy, over my inflation time frame, which is a couple of years in order to save for a deposit for a house, Bitcoin has done exactly what it needed to do. And it's not only storing my value, right? Gold has done about the same as housing. It Gold stored my value. Bitcoin grew my value. It's actually better than a store of value because it's kicking ass. It's four times better than the next best thing. So at the end of the day, it's doing exactly what it needs to do as a store of value. And people who don't agree either bought too high, right? They continue to buy too high because they're not using SOPA and MVRV, or they have this bias that they just hate Bitcoin. It's not because you think it's not a store of value. It's because you're, you're ignorant. You just don't like the asset. It's okay. Some people don't like the asset, but like, you know, you've got to be intellectually honest about these arguments. And these TradFi guys, they're just not. I think it, uh, uh, like that, that's always my way to think of like, you have Bitcoin as a store of value. Uh, Bitcoin as like an inflation hedge. But on top of that, you have adoption. And that's the volatile part. Yes. Because like people coming in, it's like a, a lot of uh, FOMO, a lot of hectic, a, a lot of uh, fear and doubts that are coming into the market with a new cycle on social media and everything uh, going on in the world. Uh, but I think like the store of value part is all, already quite um, um, stable. And uh, the volatility just comes from like, oh, we are, we are tiny asset still, and we are becoming a, like a really big asset and, uh, and the vision is really big. And there are those people that have like 1% of their net worth in, in, in Bitcoin. Then there are those, those crazy people like me that have 100% in their, their net worth. And, and like, there's a lot of yep. interesting things going on. And so I, that, that's always like how I try to explain it to people completely outside of Bitcoin, that you have like those two sets and in, in one price. And if you only look at the store of value side, of course, you cannot factor out volatility uh but yeah it's like i and, and that's why i also like michael sailor talking about volatility i think he said that's so great in in in, in the beginning of the days when when he went on the podcast he said like volatility is the price you pay for that massive uptick that yeah. you get in purchasing power if your volatility is five percent you're not going to make 30 percent a year which means you're not going to beat the inflation rate no matter what you do sure there are going to be assets out there which are 30 percent to the downside every year that's bad volatility, but you're not going to beat inflation at 25% or 20%, whatever it is, with a 5% vol asset. It's just not going to happen. You need the volatility to beat it. So in, in many ways, if we expect inflation is going to be a feature of our life moving forward in debasement, which I do, it's one of the best assets in the world because it's, gonna, it's one of the few things that's going to be able to outpace that. So here's an interesting thing. I wrote a report on Monday or Tuesday. Um, which uh, it's like, even I learned something. Like I always learned a little bit, but this was a great, I really enjoyed this piece. Um, I basically looked at, they've got the US CPI number, which we all know is bullshit. So I just tested, what is the Bitcoin price? There's two things. There's what do we see? We see $58,000 Bitcoin. What do we feel? What do we feel? And that's our purchasing power. If we look at CPI, we're actually at 45K. If we look at CPI times three, we're down at 35K. So and that's in 2020 dollars. So in terms of our 2020 purchasing power, how we feel, we never set a new all-time high, right? We The 2021, the first peak, by the way, which I've been an advocate for that first peak in April, that was the real all-time high. The November one was bullshit. Um, so much, there's, there's an infinite amount of metrics that, that tell you that that second high wasn't real. When you inflation adjust it, that first high in April, that is the all-time high. And uh, strangely enough, if you price that all-time high in today's dollars in 2024, it's 100,000. So if you look at this thing, we are 40% below that 2021 all-time high on an inflation-adjusted basis. And that assumes that CPI is three times underreported, which is probably on the low side. It could be more than that. But the real takeaway here, inflation is a really insidious tax. We may be down 25 from the March all-time high but we're actually missing an additional 14, 15% that we've lost in purchasing power over the last four years, right? That's how much that drawdown is actually way worse. So that's why a lot of people feel like this market is different. Um, we are simultaneously very small, right? 1.2 trillion is a very small asset in the grand scheme of things. But we're also very big because 1.2 trillion is not small. It's the 10th biggest asset in the world. So Bitcoin's in this really interesting world where it's both small and large. It's like a, a small fish that's just been put into a bigger pond. That's really where Bitcoin is in its life right now. So that volatility, it's going to be a part of this thing. 
the, the inflation side of the story in the debasement, all of these things. This is what Bitcoin is wrapped around. This is what it does. It is there to help people survive all of these things. And the volatility is a tool to help it do that. On that note, uh, how, uh, by the way, really, really great uh, that insight, but how does uh, ETFs and institutional money that came into like the, the last four years, basically with, with, I think 2020 with MicroStrategy, that kind of was like the starting point for for institutional publicly traded companies coming into the scene. Now the ETF falls with 2024. Had that any influence on on-chain data? That's a great question. And I get this one quite a lot, actually. Um, the short answer is no, surprisingly. And I literally wake up every single day and I'm like, the first thing I'm like, all right, which metric's broken? Something's got to break here. It's all got to die and finish. And um, a lot of people are like, oh, all the tra so here's an example. We have gone through these ETFs and I've had the same arguments, I think about four times now. What is an ETF? An ETF is a off-chain basket of pool of coins where coins go in and then they do something on the inside, trade around, whatever else. When have we seen this happen? 2017, Binance, all these centralized exchanges. Coins go in, they trade shit coins on the inside, but there's a big sink of coins that go in. We saw it in 2019. There was the plus token Ponzi. Coins went in, there's like a 2% spot bid, absorbed 2% of all the coins. They all went in and then they eventually got market sold by the, uh, by the Chinese government. We saw it with GBTC, 665,000 Bitcoin in four months fucking extraordinary amounts of volumes going all the way into this. And then the arbitrage stopped in February, 2021. A lot of people are like, oh, we should have gone to 100,000 or, oh, we was, you know, a cut short cycle. No, we had 665,000 Bitcoin of demand in four months from December through to April. And then it stopped almost in the blink of an eye. That's what killed the bull market. So that is another one. Coins go in, trade around the inside. And here we are with the ETFs. And I've been looking for so long, waiting for my metrics to, to break. But what's really interesting about it, and Jim Bianco has been banging on about why these ETFs are, you know, there's just an orange poker chip and all that stuff. The ETFs are between 10 and 20% of the total market. There's been this like weird assumption that now that the Bitcoin ETFs are here, the entire market infrastructure that's been around for 15 years, just gone, disappeared. no. It's still the 90% of the market, right? The ETFs are big, but they're not dominant. So we are not at the phase where the ETFs are driving things. They may get there. They'll get, they'll grow in size. They are simultaneously, like Bitcoin, simultaneously the most successful ETFs that have ever launched and less than 10% of the market. So they're both big and small at the same time. So, you know, it's just one of those classic narratives where we wait for these metrics to break but it's all those coins, you and I, transacting coins in and out. Every day, billions of dollars goes in and billions of dollars comes out of exchanges. Every single one of those coins has a signature of who bought it, at what price, and what's their profit and loss. Every single one. Is that also why this four-year cycle doesn't break? That's a good question, actually. Um, I'm, I'm undecided on what happens with the four-year cycle. I am going into this cycle assuming that it won't break because so far it hasn't and simultaneously assuming it's already broken because so I'm not anchoring to either direction because it really could be if there's one time where it's likely to be broken, it's now. A theory I've been playing around with, which is not fully formed, but this concept of like maybe people forget what the cycle looks like. So for example, this, this last like six months is just sideways, boring, choppy price action. And I actually did an exercise today where I took the whole trading view price chart and I took one year and I literally just scrolled slowly from left to right since the beginning of the price all the way through. And I was looking for anything that looks like our current price structure. There's nothing. The only close equivalent is 2019. That's by far the closest. And I've had this like weird idea. It's, again, it's just an idea. There's no real basis to it aside from gut feel. What if people lose track of where we are in the cycle? We have this like rally and then like just sideways. Did we just have a bear? Did we have a bull? Are we still in like the bull? Like where, where the hell are we? And people just like lose track of, but hang on a second, it's December. Shouldn't we be at a top and it's down? Like just, just things that just throw people off and everyone's going to go looking for, here's the parabola. Oh no, here's the bear. And it's just not going to look the same. That's an instinct that I have that we just kind of lose track of things because everyone's looking for the obvious answer. 
And I think there's enough people looking for that obvious answer. In my experience, markets tend to do something else. When everyone's looking for the obvious answer, it tends to go somewhere else. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you also see how many people hold their Bitcoin on exchange versus like in self-custody? Is there like a metrics like that? Because I feel like most Bitcoiners hold it on exchange, but most Bitcoin are hold in self-custody. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I haven't checked the numbers in a little while because I, I don't spend too much time looking at exchange balances. Last I checked, it was something like two and a half million um, Bitcoin and exchanges. And honestly, that's been pretty flat for years, right? So here's another pro tip. Everyone loves to share exchange balances. Mute, complete noise. There's no alpha in it whatsoever. When you see, oh shit, exchange balances are almost completely drained, mute that person because they have no idea what they're talking about. Exchange balances are never completely drained. Someone will always deposit them and it's more likely you're looking at a data error. So uh, exchange balances are just not useful information. What a lot of people miss is that those coins go in and out of Coinbase and Coinbase custody and they, they're moving around between all these big institutions and OTC desks. It is not worth worrying about unless you're a fully equipped and qualified data scientist. Don't worry about exchange balances. Um, that said, in terms of like their general size, there's something in the order of like two and a half million. Coinbase custody has got like another million coins, but that's got ETFs and MicroStrategy and all that kind of GBTC. So there's a whole lot of dynamics there. But um, yeah, a lot of people love exchange balance metrics because they like think that it's like, oh, look, supply squeeze. No, nah, there won't be a supply squeeze because people continue to sell. And this is the great irony. It was like, you know, Everyone's like, oh, no, the price is, you know, it's going to squeeze at any minute. It's like, no, it's not because guys are still selling when that stops, maybe. But uh, until that point, no. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, if <laughs> if people have that argument that exchanges will run out of uh, out of Bitcoin, yeah. it's like, no, it, it will not. Because even if the price runs high, at some point, someone is selling. And Correct. the price might run up really heavily. It depends on what happens. Maybe have half inflation, whatever. Uh, but at some point there is like a stop to it. Uh, and I don't know, maybe we come to the point of like people don't want to trade Bitcoin for any fiat currency, but I, th that's like hyper Bitcoinization. But that's even then we have a Bitcoin market. So um, yeah, do, I mean, do you that's see that thing, too? Like if, if I wake up one day and there's a tweet that's believable, it's like there's only one Bitcoin left. The price will be like a billion dollars and I will sell one Bitcoin to just add to that It's just, you know, like if, if you wake up tomorrow and the price is a million dollars, every single person sitting and listening to this will probably, you may not actually sell, but you better believe that your brain's going to be like, ooh, maybe. That's, that's for sure. That's for sure. Um, do you think that fiat currency will, will always be around? I do actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the camp where as much as fiat is a blight on society, governments will never give up the control. And in many ways, as a Bitcoiner, I would much rather have an asset that I can use to transact in my economy, that I can borrow and not be even remotely concerned that it's going to blow me up. If I borrow Bitcoin, that's hard because if I, you know, if I'm now short Bitcoin, if I sell it to buy anything, I'm now short Bitcoin. That's that's a tough sell. If I borrow Australian dollars, it's going to be toilet paper the longer I hold it. So essentially, I can, you know, go and use spend that into the economy. I can borrow against my hard, scarce Bitcoin. And use that in the economy. And honestly, I think this is a this is the third in the whole world of crypto. I believe there are three primary product market fits. There is stable coins, which undeniably are a product market fit. There's Bitcoin as the ultimate store of value asset, and there's the ability to borrow against my my Bitcoin. Those are the three killer apps. I don't think there are any other killer apps in in the crypto world. And You know, the, I think fiat currency will always be around. I think the US dollar will be the reserve currency for as long as I'm alive. I just don't see these power balances changing. There, there's, there's no other real alternative. The world's not ready to go to a Bitcoin standard. It's probably not even ready to go to a gold standard. What it is prepared for is for the people who understand those two assets, Bitcoin and gold, to probably do pretty well over the next decade and a half because they understand the problem that we're facing. Fiat currency will get debased. But as you would no doubt know, and pretty much everyone listening to this would know, you've got a lot of friends out there that you still can't convince, no matter all this inflation, all this, that you still can't convince them to get Bitcoin. So we are so far away from people losing faith. And if, if you can't convince 100% of your friends that they should buy a little bit of Bitcoin, there ain't no chance fiat currency is going anywhere until you solve that problem. 
this argument makes sense because like I, I made uh, I think a week ago or something like that a podcast with Ariel uh, Aguilar from from Argentina. Uh, I think he wrote Bitcoin Prophecy or something like that. The, the book is called, and we basically went through uh, Argentina's history, and there were like a lot of points where like they created a new local <laughs> uh, currency of of Argentina. However, it was called. It lasted two years. Then they made a new one. It lasted four years. Uh, and they still keep going. Like the inflation is massive. When you look at Argentina, they they earned a thousand dollars five years ago. Now they're earning three hundred dollars. Like that, that that that's massive. Bad. But they still are not on a hybrid bit conversation. The same with Turkey. So I'm really positive and really optimistic on Bitcoin. Maybe being one day the only currency and asset that we have. But then I also look at reality on Argentina and Turkey and all those places. And I'm like they don't get Bitcoin. <laughs> like I get why someone uh, with a 10, 20, 30% inflation rate doesn't get Bitcoin. When, but when it gets to the hundreds and even thousands and half inflation, where we like just completely demolish a few currency and make a new one up then the next day, like <laughs> we, yep. we need like people not waking up to that. Like I, I'm, no, and, I'm and growing I think the, more realistic. Um, the, the, the thing I find quite interesting about those scenarios is they're adopting Tether. And if you think about the scale between the euro and Bitcoin, the Australian dollar and Bitcoin, that magnitude of scarcity delta is probably about the same as the Argentine peso to the US dollar. It's about the same magnitude, right? In log scale, that's a one to a 10 and then 10 to a hundred. So in a way, when we see this dollarization, they're not ready for the full quantum leap from one to a hundred, but they are ready for the one to 10. And in the Western world, you know, the, the one to 10 is probably the gold and Bitcoin. That's the next kind of step for them. So we're going to see these little microcosms of what happens when you go from an unsound money to a sounder money. The US dollar may not be sound, but it's sure as hell sound versus the Turkish lira. So we're going to see these like adoption curves of what happens to a society when you start to improve by a naturally market-based alternative, which is the US dollar. So I think that's a really interesting and underappreciated microcosm of what hyper Bitcoinization could look like if it happened in the Western world. Really, really cool. Thank you so much. Um, we are already in the, the end routine of our podcast where we ask the same question to every guest and then uh, another question. The first question that every guest gets, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Oh, interesting. Um, I think always like you have to invest in yourself, right? I mean, for me, my my like main hobby, my addiction is kite surfing. And there's something about being like half, like 75% in control and 25% just let nature take the wheel. For me, that like that risk component actually relaxes my mind. Um, another saying is that when I, I was living in London and my friend uh, came to live with us for a bit and um, he'd been living, I think he was in Poland and Netherlands. So he was like really like just out living by himself. Um, and he said, you have to find your yogurt. And what did he mean by that? He's like, Every morning, he just has his granola and his yogurt. And that was the thing that like oriented him for the day. So I, I think like people find find your yogurt, find the thing that like orients you and just like grounds you for the day. Find the thing that helps you de-stress and relax and like find yourself. Because at the end of the day, whether you're an investor, whatever you're doing, the your biggest enemy in everything is always yourself. You spend so much more time thinking through your own thoughts and going through your own, you spend more time with yourself than with anyone else in your life. So learning to understand who you are and what drives you is really, really powerful because it sets you up for everything else, right? And you can attack all these problems differently. Um, go for a walk. I find going for a walk is just tremendous. It's like reset my brain. Um, I also, like for me, I've realized that sometimes when I write an article, the next day, I actually need the whole day to just like allow my juices to recharge. Um, so, you know, Find your yogurt. It's probably how I'd uh, I'd answer that question. Are you walking with with uh, music or podcast or like just like uh, playing podcast. nothing? Yeah, no, I'm I'm a I I don't know how many hours of podcast I consume a week, but it's a lot. Oh no, yeah, it's 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 great. Like podcasts, like I'm always switching between podcasts and music. It's like kind of like uh, switching around. It's it, but yeah. it's really interesting yeah. when you walk with nothing. Like that that feels no, it uh, is weird. It, 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 that that um, thing go deep. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, your brain is much better at processing information when you're walking. It like activates more parts of your brain. So walking, Einstein used to walk like five hours a day because it just like helped him digest information. I think that's probably about right. 
Absolutely, really cool. Perfect. And uh, our other Andrew Dean is where the previous guest is, question, uh, is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, and the question is, assume Bitcoin becomes gold 2.0. What does that look like? Interesting. So I think it's, it's kind of a dynamic where Bitcoin is, I mean, the fact that we had two presidential candidates in the US, even just, it's not going to happen, not anytime soon, but talking about Bitcoin as a reserve asset, that is very interesting, you know, like that, that we are not talking, there's no silver conferences doing this. Um, another one, there's the, the in gold, we trust report, which is like a fantastic macro research piece comes out once a year, probably one of the most viewed macro articles in the, in the industry. They had a whole segment on gold on Bitcoin. They had it at like 3% recommended portfolio allocation between three and five. And it was in the pages before silver. This is a gold report. And they have Bitcoin before silver. We're there, guys. We're like getting very, very close to this point where it's on the same playing field. Now, what does gold 2.0 look like? There's always the risk that like with gold, you know, in terms of that manipulation conversation we had before, there's been claims about the gold market being manipulated forever. And I, I believe those actually. And the reason why that happens is you've got 100 to 1 paper claims versus physical. I don't know about you, if you've ever gone to buy physical gold, if you haven't, it is a process. It is not an easy thing. Most people do not want to have bars of expensive metal in their house. So it's one of those things that the custody, the custody is the reason that that happens with gold. You cannot, there is no company in the world who can rehypothecate my Bitcoin because they don't have it. Yeah, I've got it. It's not theirs. So Self-custody of Bitcoin is so critically important because it is the defense mechanism against gold 2.0. Um, I think that when you go through the process of looking at like silver coins, they're heavy, they're bulky, they're big. If they get scratched, they lose value. Sometimes they just tarnish on their own. Like there's all sorts of problems there. Gold is exponentially smaller per unit of value. One gold coin is 85 silver coins. Bitcoin is no space at all exponentially better. So it is, or it's, it's, it's better than gold, right? So it's going to get there. Um, I think gold will always be a, an asset for the central banks and governments. I think Bitcoin will be that same thing for the individual and maybe the corporation. And that's great. I think that is Bitcoin's sole purpose is to help people like you and I avoid the whole inflation side of this equation. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, James, for being on. Uh, before I let you go, where can people find you and, and read your uh, articles and newsletter? Yeah, so you'll find me at, uh, at underscore checkmatey over at Twitter. And um, our newsletter is at check on chain. So it's one word, check on chain. Um, we've got a whole charting website. So literally every on-chain chart you've ever wanted, we've got all of it. Um, and the thing I try to do with it is um, we don't just give you the metric. We try to have the chart tell the, the, chart tells the whole story. When something that's important is happening, the chart's going to be red, right? So we're not just going to give you a price chart be like, good luck, here's your Lego. We try to help people actually navigate using these tools and, and kind of survive. So if you head over to checkonchain.com, um, you'll find both our newsletter and our, um, uh, and our charting website. And uh, yeah, I mean, we love getting feedback. So if you've got any comments or questions, uh, feel free to hit me up. Ah, really cool. Thank you so much. Perfect. Then uh, thank you for being on. Thank you also for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.